2008's Web of Shadows is a glorious mess with perhaps the best Spider-Man combat out there, at least the transitions from ground to walls to air, were damn smooth. But the story is what always separated it from the pack. I was 13 when Web of Shadows came out, and this cringy angst fest was targeted right at me. The bad boy path has you ripping Wolverine in half and smooching an even scantily ur-clad black cat. It's gratuitous and over the top, and I love it. Replaying it recently had me thinking about what a sequel could have been like. I know there's info out there about the cancelled sequel, Spider-Man Classic, but my pitch has nothing to do with that. Instead, I think it would be far more interesting to explore what happens after the black suit ending, which would not only set the series apart from every Spidey adventure before or since, but also a nasty boy take like this would have thrived in the early 2010s. So let me pitch you this, Mr. Big Time Executive, who is also a dog. New York City has been overrun by symbiotes, transforming it into an unrecognizable, gooey zombie apocalypse, with even the tallest skyscrapers overgrown into twisted towers of ooze. Spider-Man rules over this mess with his army, Black Cat at his side, and Vulture as his trusted advisor. One year has passed since the city fell, and Spidey is just about to set his expansion plans in motion, but the remaining heroes have their own plan for Manhattan. However, no one wants Spider-Man dead more than the second playable character, Carnage. Now that I've got your attention, let's talk about gameplay. Peter wouldn't be able to swap between his black and red suit. He's black suit the whole game. Carnage would have a wholly new combat system, so each hero gets their own combat style that evolves as the game goes on. I'm not a game designer, so I'll try to minimize exposing my sheer arrogance by just summing up what I envision for Carnage. I'm picturing him moving more wildly, like a flailing, spindly berserker. Of course, Peter would receive his own upgrades. For example, he's adopted some of Electro's abilities due to the symbiote evolving. This can be used in combat and to interact with the environment, like short-circuiting anti-symbiote weaponry. Remember those anti-symbiote domes? Well, Peter can short them, get inside, and destroy the generator to take them down permanently. Cool shit like that, okay? Damn, maybe I'm actually the world's greatest game designer. Outside of combat, the only other mechanic I'd like to talk through is the morality system. But first, the reason I think Spider-Man needs to be limited to the black suit, and that the story needs to continue from the evil ending, is because it's the only thing that makes any goddamn sense. This world is so fucked up. So many people died in the first game. Things got dark, but that's what made it fun, which would continue to set this fictional sequel apart. This is the darkest Spider-Man timeline. Finding out what the hell happens next is a more captivating hook than a sequel that goes, Welp, that was all crazy. What brand new kooky adventure will I get up to this time? Like it or think it's hilariously cringe, the full-blown symbiote Spider-Man franchise is a unique idea. So that's why I'm going this route. I personally think it's more fun, and I'm in charge, and you're just a stupid dog. Fuck. Sorry, I, I didn't mean that. You're a, you're a good boy. But don't take that to mean there won't be any moral decisions in this game. Choices will be made. Just like the symbiote abilities, that's part of the fun. This time around, you'll be making choices as both Spider-Man and Carnage. Rather than keeping the decisions as simple as good or bad, they'll be more situational, determining how other characters interact with both protagonists throughout the story, if they survive. But for context, there were only like 10 major choices in the first game, and I'm being generous with the word major, so I'll be sticking to a limited amount of choices too, because I tried writing a draft with more frequent choices, and things quickly spiraled out of control. With that said, let's establish some ground rules for the story. The first rule of this story is bombastic, over-the-top fun. I think it's universally accepted that the script for Web of Shadows isn't its strong point, but it did a great job incorporating the larger Marvel Universe and delivering massive set pieces filled with ridiculous action that made it enthralling to play through. So, why mess with the formula? In that spirit, I won't be getting into the nitty gritty, the beat for beat of the player's experience. There'll be plenty of side mission busy work and minor character interactions that I'm gonna blow right over. With major choices, I'll try and detail the consequences, 
but I'll mostly skim over minor ones since the narrative will generally snap back into place anyway. Those are the only rules, so let's get into it. The game opens with Spider-Man sitting on a gooey black throne. Vulture drones on over a holographic presentation about their plans to expand beyond Manhattan. Spidey looks disinterested, and Black Cat begins teasing him. Just then, the wall around them explodes, and in flies Iron Man, leading a battalion of iron drones. He tackles Spider-Man straight out the opposite wall, revealing that they were inside what was once the Empire State Building, now transformed nearly beyond recognition with the rest of the landscape. Spidey sees three shield helicarriers descending from the clouds. In a quick time event, he damages the propulsion in Iron Man's boots, and the pair tumble down to the rooftops. The first boss fight begins. Iron Man berates Spidey, telling him that he got too big for his britches while the real heroes were busy. S.H.I.E.L.D. wanted him to wait until their plan was ready, but he got antsy knowing he can kick Spider-Man's ass any day, with or without some alien parasite. Spidey tells him he's done being underestimated by so-called heroes who couldn't be bothered to help when the shit hit the fan. He's the one who saved New York, and soon, he'll save the world. The fight takes place around Spidey's HQ, with Spider-Man winning and having the choice to either kill Iron Man or have his vulturelings carry his bloodied body back to S.H.I.E.L.D. as a message. Either way, Spider-Man returns to his throne room to find that Black Cat and Vulture were able to fend off the drones. If Spider-Man killed Iron Man, he hands Vulture his severed helmet and tells him to add it to the others. There's then a shot of Moon Knight's hood, Kingpin's head, and J. Jonah Jameson's head mounted on a nearby wall. If you choose to let Iron Man live, Vulture tells Spidey that S.H.I.E.L.D. is bound to retaliate. The choices reconverge with Black Cat declaring they must pause the expansion and focus on fortifying. Vulture protests, stating that the threat from S.H.I.E.L.D. is exactly why expansion is so important. Black Cat retorts that it isn't just S.H.I.E.L.D. They've yet to deal with the force field around the Baxter building and the meddlesome resistance. More annoyed than anything, Spidey orders his symbiotes to patch up the shattered walls, then sits upon his throne. He tells his confidants that the time for choices will come. For now, they'll sit back and wait for their enemies to make their next mistake. Cut to black. From a first-person perspective, blurred eyes come into focus on a mirror as a voice whispers, Cletus, you know you don't have to give in. You can be better. There is a clanging, and the view shifts to reveal that Cletus is in a cell. If Spider-Man chose to spare Iron Man, he appears on the other side. If not, then it's Black Widow. Both essentially say that the time has come for Carnage to descend upon the city. That's right, Carnage is now a S.H.I.E.L.D. asset. How did that happen? Well, it will be revealed in flashbacks prototype style throughout the game, but I'll sum it up now. A pre-symbiote Cletus Cassidy was aboard the helicarrier at the end of the first game as part of a prison transfer from Rikers Island. During his brief detention there, he developed a rapport with a kindly S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who managed to save him from the helicarrier before Spider-Man destroyed it by sacrificing herself. Fueled by rage, Cletus managed to pull himself from the river, where an offspring of the recently killed Venom clung to him. So, this is an alternate Carnage origin story where he has a pre-established vendetta against Spider-Man, which is supercharged by the symbiote. He was re-arrested by S.H.I.E.L.D. where his ability is manifested. So, S.H.I.E.L.D. offered him a deal. Carnage would be freed if he helped to kill Spider-Man, which he happily accepted. I know this is a different take on Carnage, but ideally, getting to control how he turns out would be a fun enough journey for even avid fans to appreciate the adaptation. Plus, having Carnage struggling with his morality fits within the web of series. Does he become a better person like that S.H.I.E.L.D. agent thought he could be, or does he succumb to his instincts and give in to the symbiote? Anyway, the floor beneath Carnage opens up, and he plummets into the unrecognizable mass of goo below. Before hitting the ground, he targets a symbiote and uses it to break his fall, finding himself in a nest he has to defeat. The last symbiote he goes to kill is changed by interacting with the Carnage symbiote, shifting to a red color before ultimately melting away. Confused, Carnage enters free roam, and Black Widow gives him his first assignment. Contact the Harlem Resistance. So he fights his way through a sewer system until he finds Luke Cage, Mary Jane, and Daredevil. They go to attack, but he delivers a communicator from Black Widow, who assures them Carnage wants to stop Spider-Man. All the heroes, especially MJ, refuse to blindly trust him, but 
tentatively agree to work alongside him, knowing that his power may be what they need to break through the siege on the Baxter building and link up with the Fantastic Four. I wanted to spend a bit of time detailing how the story begins for both characters since there's a decent amount of stage setting that needs to happen, but going forward I'm going to keep things much more bare bones to just provide the overall flow. There will be some blanks that I encourage you to fill in for yourselves. Next up, Spider-Man begins battling the S.H.I.E.L.D. forces trying to get a foothold in the city, then joins Vulture and his symbiotes in a mission to repair the George Washington Bridge to further their expansion plans, but the bridge is struck by a powerful rain of lightning. Spider-Man immediately knows who did this, but Daredevil shows up to challenge him. They zip across the city, and Daredevil is defeated, but reveals he was just the distraction. In the skyline, the Baxter Building force field momentarily goes down before flaring back up again. Spidey questions what Reed Richards is up to, while ordering Vulture to take Daredevil with them. Cut to earlier that day, as Carnage goes to break the Baxter Building siege, fighting off hordes of symbiotes. Black Cat appears to challenge him, asking why Carnage would fight against his own kind. The fight ends with Carnage having a choice. Resist his instincts, or give in. If he resists, he manages to purge Black Cat of her symbiote. If he gives in, he tries to kill her, but ends up seriously maiming her instead as she escapes. Like a missing eye, or maybe even a hand. These choices influence how the rest of the heroes view Carnage. Regardless, he manages to make contact with the Fantastic Four, who are hesitant to trust him, until Luke Cage and Mary Jane arrive, claiming to have information from S.H.I.E.L.D. The force field is dropped momentarily, and the unlikely trio are greeted by Mr. Fantastic, The Thing, and The Human Torch. MJ asks where Sue is, and Reed reveals that she's been keeping up this force field on her own, non-stop, for six months. That 30 seconds was the first break she's had, so she's not up for seeing visitors right now. Luke says that there isn't any time to waste, and hands Reed a thumb drive. Back with Spidey, we see the consequences of Carnage's decision with Black Cat. If she was purged, she slowly begins to turn on Spider-Man, and he comes to rely on Vulture more. If Black Cat was only injured, she doubles down on her desire to secure their territory, and Vulture begins to turn on Spider-Man. Spidey's next move is to take the fight to S.H.I.E.L.D., and he eventually leads the Vulturelings, alongside either Black Cat or Vulture, to take on one of the Helicarriers. Before they're able to destroy it, the ally is knocked unconscious by a flying hammer, which returns with a crackle of lightning to Thor's grip the fight with the God of Thunder begins. Spider-Man manages to defeat Thor, in part due to his own electrical abilities, and managing to outmaneuver Thor into accidentally destroying the Helicarrier himself. Spidey rescues his ally from the explosion, and Thor is incapacitated for the foreseeable future. After touching back down into the city, Spidey sees that the top of the Baxter building is beginning to fly into the air, revealing freshly installed Stark Tech thrusters. As it ascends to one of the two remaining helicarriers, the force field deactivates. Spider-Man realizes he's been outmaneuvered. Thor intervening to destroy all the Vulturelings assured a continued airborne assault would be impossible. Regardless, he commands his forces into the sky. Inside the Baxter building… head… thing. The allies realize Spider-Man is trying to attack them, and before anyone can make a decision, Carnage leaps out a window at the remaining Vulturelings, and then boss battles Spidey-Man. The two air their grievances, pun intended, and at the end of the battle, Spider-Man makes one last lunge for the Baxter building, but is stopped by Carnage, and the two crash down into the city below. After Carnage comes to, he remarks that he's really starting to hate heights, and gets a call from Natasha and Reed, who thank him. They've met up and are formulating a plan. In the meantime, Carnage should destroy pods around the city that can produce more Vulturelings. He does, and the last one he touches turns red. The symbiotes that emerge are red and obey him. He shares this info with Reed and does a couple more missions that result in a decent chunk of red symbiotes which clash with Spider-Man's. Spidey looks down upon his city, feeling control slipping away. He looks up at the helicarrier and wonders if she is up there. Black Cat and Vulture bicker behind his back. It's time to make a choice. Side with Vulture and choose expansion, or side with Black Cat and choose fortification. This impacts the next couple of side missions and the location of the next boss fight, as well as an upcoming decision. But either way, Spider-Man declares that a show of force is coming, 
and summons Symbiote Electro and Symbiote Rhino from the shadows. After a few missions working with these two, Spidey goes to assist either of his allies based on the choice he made. Either results in a conflict with Luke Cage, who's been upgraded by Stark Tech, granting him increased maneuverability and punching power. At the end of the fight, Spider-Man chooses whether to kill Luke or convert him into a symbiote. Afterward, Spider-Man decides, it's time to make a statement. Meanwhile, Carnage has been experimenting with his abilities, but is interrupted by the character that Spider-Man did not side with. Either Vulture or Black Cat is here to make a deal. Now, there are several versions of this offer, but they all boil down to secret team up. A fight breaks out, and at the end, Carnage needs to choose whether or not to trust them. If he does, they are new allies. If he doesn't, then he tests out his abilities to convert them to loyal symbiotes with new red designs. Carnage then alerts S.H.I.E.L.D., who brings them up to the Helicarrier for an allied council meeting. In the middle of it, the neighboring Helicarrier comes under attack, and their Helicarrier is rattled by some impact. Carnage rushes outside to investigate, and finds Symbiote Wolverine and Symbiote Daredevil tearing it up. And if the player chose to convert Luke Cage, he's with them too. Carnage has to battle all three adversaries with the help of Johnny Storm and The Thing. Due to this distraction, Spider-Man's forces manage to overrun the second helicarrier, converting every person aboard to symbiotes to refresh his troops, sending the unmanned helicarrier crashing into the city settling into the landscape as a bastardized skyscraper. Black Widow turns to Reed and Sue and says they don't have a moment to lose. Mary Jane looks down at the city and wonders how he can live with himself. Turns out, quite well. Spider-Man capitalizes on his victory by going on a rampage against the remaining Resistance fighters. After destroying their HQ, the Baxter building comes floating down with no force field, which makes Spidey suspicious. He checks it out, fighting his way through some F4 security, but realizes there's nothing inside, except for Johnny Storm, who hit a board against the Fantastic Four's wishes to get the drop on Spidey. Spider-Man just barely manages to defeat Johnny, needing to be rescued by his top ally. Back on the ground, Carnage has been assigned a very particular mission from Black Widow. She wants him to focus all his efforts on Lower Manhattan. This brings him into conflict with Electro and Rhino, who he can either kill or convert. Meanwhile, Spider-Man's top ally is growing concerned. With Electro and Rhino taken down, plus all the symbiotic heroes defeated, they're running out of options. Spider-Man agrees, but he has one trump card he's been saving. For now, he is going to lead the fight against the Red Symbiotes and end Carnage's coup once and for all. Missions to take back Lower Manhattan lead to an all-out brawl with Spider-Man kicking Carnage's ass. However, as Spider-Man is about to finish him, the city shakes. A report from his ally reveals that the Baxter building has exploded. Troops are pouring out of it with high-tech weaponry, flying the Latvarian flag. Doctor Doom has arrived. Turns out, Reed's plan was to use his portal to the negative zone as a Trojan horse. S.H.I.E.L.D. had already made a deal with Doom. Sounds ridiculous, but they were desperate. And of course, everyone always underestimates the ambition of Doom. Spider-Man rushes off to reinforce his troops, leaving Carnage to lick his wounds. Doom's forces show no mercy to any of the symbiotes. Carnage calls on S.H.I.E.L.D. to request they only target the blue ones, but that was never gonna happen. Black Widow commands him to aid Doom, but he refuses. Lashing out in anger, he kills any of Doom's troops that he sees as he heads for the epicenter of the fighting. But he is stopped by the Thing. He never trusted Carnage, but he hates that he can't just let him at that son of a bitch Doom. So it's clobberin' time. But of course, Carnage wins leaving him with a choice. Kill the Thing, betraying the heroes to take on Spider-Man by himself, or spare the Thing and side with the heroes in destroying all symbiotes. All the while, a war is raging between Spider-Man and Doctor Doom's forces. Furious, Spider-Man fights through hordes of Latvarian soldiers who are burning every symbiote they can find, charging forward to face Doom. Eventually, he manages to break into Doom's command center, unleashing his symbiotes inside. But Doom is prepared. 
He uses a device designed by the Tinkerer, but perfected by Doom, to bring the symbiotes under his control. Green symbiotes he aims to enhance with his Doom bots. Doom decrees that he may have agreed to help Richards, but Doom serves no master. He curses Spider-Man for the suffering he has inflicted on the innocent, but thanks him for serving as the catalyst for his conquest. The fight ends with Spider-Man overwhelmed. Doom is victorious, and attempts to convert Spider-Man, until an explosion shatters the command center apart. Cut to Carnage's perspective. A Lovecraftian beast emerges from the smoking wreckage, swiping at the Latvarian soldiers fleeing beneath his multi-limbed silhouette. In one tentacle lays a crushed and struggling Doom, in the other, an unconscious Spider-Man. Carnage races in and recognizes the creature as a symbiotized Dr. Octopus with a squadron of Octo-symbiotes arising from the ground. Spider-Man's trump card. Carnage fights through the battlefield of Latvarians and symbiotes, eventually battling Doc Ock and losing control, ripping him limb from limb. With Spider-Man recovering and Doctor Doom's forces decimated, the player is presented with a choice. Fight Carnage as Spider-Man, or fight Spider-Man as Carnage. No matter what, the fight takes place atop the command center wreckage, partially crashed halfway up the Empire State Building, with the final helicarrier closing in on the horizon. The two characters are well aware that this is for all the marbles, each vying for control over the symbiote army. If Spider-Man wins, he has a choice kill Carnage, or finally convert him. Either option results in the death of all the allies on the final helicarrier, but it determines if Spider-Man has a new best buddy by his side as he plans his expansion from Manhattan. If Carnage wins, either way, he kills Spider-Man, but he has this choice, destroy the symbiote army or control them. If he destroys the symbiotes, the heroes touch down in the helicarrier, thank Carnage for his heroics, and peace is finally restored to NYC. If he controls them, he starts a bloodthirsty reign of terror by converting every remaining hero and flying off with a fully manned helicarrier ready to deliver maximum carnage to the world. So yeah, that's my pitch. What do you think? Personally, I tried to make it as big and bombastic as possible, really playing into the attitude that made the first game so memorable while trying to keep the technical limitations in mind. Although, I'm sure some of you have much better, and dare I say, edgier ideas than me, so please let me know what your Web of Shadows sequel would look like. That's all from me, thanks for watching, and take care.